David, uh, thank you for participating. Uh, well, thank you, Andrea, Eric, and, and, and Andy for organizing this. Uh, I, my group had had a very rapid introduction to Columbia. Uh, we moved to the campus uh, in early January. And as we were settling down, we were hearing more and more about the pneumonia outbreak in the city of Wuhan. And we obviously uh, pay attention because it was reminiscent of, of SARS. And as the uh, outbreak in Wuhan got worse, uh, we started to think about getting involved uh, since we're a virology group uh, and, and started to uh, obtain or uh, construct reagents that would be relevant uh, for carrying out research. And of course, by then we knew uh, that this was a novel coronavirus. So basically in, in late January, we, we jumped in um, uh, to, to start to address this, uh, uh, essentially using our expertise uh, from the HIV field. And then very quickly, uh, we got to know a few folks uh, on campus who were uh, interested uh, in pursuing this and uh, we formed a, a very uh, small consortium at the, at the beginning. I'm having trouble advancing my slide here. Okay. Uh, and, and so we wanted to uh, primarily focus on, on therapeutics uh, against the coronavirus. Uh, the, the genome had been well characterized in the past. Uh, my group wanted to go after uh, the spike uh, protein that uh, you could see protruding from the, uh, from the surface of the virion. And um, the, we were uh, contacted by the Jack Ma Foundation uh, in terms of what we're doing and uh, we responded very quickly uh, with a proposal uh, that involved uh, a number of groups including Alex Chavez from pathology uh, who had an assay going uh, for protease inhibitors uh, and and then we approached uh, Yossi Sabo and Steve Goff uh, who were interested in uh, going after the polymerase and of course we heard uh, from the engineering school uh, particularly from uh, Jing Yue Ju, who uh, had been working on, on nucleosides uh, as potential inhibitors for uh, polymerase. So in, in that fashion, uh, my group together with these groups uh, uh, in, in the course of 72 hours, wrote a proposal to the Ma Foundation and, and received funding. And that's how we uh, got started. And, and my group, uh, so I think Alex will speak and, and, other, and, and Jing Yue will speak uh, today. I believe uh, Steve or Yoshi will speak in the future. Uh, my team is primarily focused on uh, trying to uh, isolate uh, mon neutralizing monoclonals from uh, convalescent patients. We are at the same time uh, screening and constructing uh, entry inhibitors uh, to be tested in the system. I will not speak about that particular effort, but I will just tell you uh, the work that we have uh, initiated uh, in, in the recent weeks. So obviously uh, we are going after uh, the spike trimer, the structure of which uh, was uh, recently solved by Jason McLennan. Um, and it, it's shown here, uh, I will not uh, go through the description. I, I think everyone uh, here knows that the trimer, particularly the receptor binding domain shown in green, uh, binds to the receptor uh, on epithelial uh, cells of the airways, and that receptor is ACE2. And so we are basically looking for antibodies that would bind to this structure and mediate virus neutralization. And so uh, there are people who are doing this by immunizing, uh, say, humanized mice and generating uh, neutralizing monoclonals and multiple approaches that could be taken. 
uh, we chose to uh, approach this uh, using three strategies uh, in parallel simultaneously. Uh, obviously, we, we need to identify the right patients. Uh, and at that time, uh, when we began, uh, New York had no cases. And so we reached out to collaborators in, in mainland China, as well as in Hong Kong. Um, and of course, uh, I think some of you know, it's exceedingly difficult to get clinical material out of mainland China. And so we went to uh, Professor K.Y. Yuan at University of Hong Kong, who had been working on SARS uh, for, for many, many years and, and began to work on COVID-19 as soon as the virus was identified. And he uh, screened <clears throat> his uh, set of patients in Hong Kong and found two uh, <clears throat> that had uh, good uh, ELISA titers in their hands and uh, sent uh, cryopreserved PBMCs as well as uh, serum samples to us. And we quickly constructed a number of uh, reagents, including uh, the spike trimer as described by Jason McLennan and the S1 portion of, of the uh, spike gene. And as you could see, these two individuals had good binding activities uh, uh, to, to these proteins, uh, binding the trimer better than the uh, S1 protein. And, and we also, in, in this particular uh, case, the one of the Hong Kong patients, HK9110 in the um, maroon color, uh, you could see now trying to use the serum to neutralize the pseudovirus, uh, it had very good activity. All the other ones are either negative controls or recently infected individuals in New York City. And, and this is something to bear in mind for, for those of you who are thinking about uh, plasma therapy, uh, it's going to take a while, particularly for, uh, for patients who, who are infected and are not so severely uh, ill. Uh, their, their neutralizing responses are uh, minimal a uh, few weeks after uh, uh, infect recovery from the infection. So it, the severe cases, as you see in uh, HK910, uh, develop uh, antibody uh, neutralizing responses faster. You could also see here, this is the first case submitted to NYP. Um, and and sequential uh, serum samples uh, trying to neutralize the pseudovirus, uh, COVID-19 pseudovirus. Uh, you see the first sample in purple uh, had neutralizing activity, but that was already uh, I, I think about two weeks into his illness, and then uh, sequentially uh, the curves uh, shifted to the left, indicating greater and greater potency. So uh, we we have basically started to work with these uh, three uh, three cases uh, to attempt to isolate uh, neutralizing monoclonals. We intend to do this on a dozen uh, overall. And the, there are multiple strategies uh, we are taking, as uh, I mentioned earlier. One is to work with our collaborator, Brendan Tukoski. Brendan trained uh, uh, with Peter Kwong and John Moscola at the BRC at NIH. Uh, and he's uh, developed a, a really nice te technique where, whereby he, uh, well, we, we would take the blood from the cases, isolate PBMC, uh, and basically sort for uh, memory uh, B cells that are CD27 positive. And then he has a way of uh, putting these uh, B cells in, in droplets um, and then within the droplets do RT-PCR and clone out the heavy and light chain genes and then display them on a East library. Uh, and then that East library could be screened for uh, any bait we wish to use. It could be the trimer, it could be the S1 protein, it could be the receptor binding domain. Now this Brendan strategy uh, is, is, is good in that this East library is renewable. 
all the other approaches, it's one and done. <coughs> and Brendan has already constructed uh, two, uh, the, the East Library from the first two Hong Kong patients. Uh, and we sent him a set of probes uh, with S1 gene, with the trimer, and with the receptor binding domain. <coughs> and he has started to screen. He's in the midst of constructing the East Library from the third case, that's the New York case. And probably we'll have that done in a week. Uh, this whole process only takes about a week for him. <coughs> this, the second approach we're taking, uh, and this is uh, largely in-house, is to once again, go through a sorting strategy, um, basically um, excluding out uh, CD3 uh, T cells and then sort for CD19 positive and CD20 negative plasma blasts. Now, plasma blasts, when you draw it at the right time, uh, in, in the setting of HIV infection, we know that a good fraction, say 20, 30% of plasma blasts would be making the appropriate antibodies. So we would sort those cells out and then uh, work uh, with uh, sort of a consortium formed by uh, Victor Guo, Chuck Drake, and Peter Sims. This was uh, all done in the past week. Uh, and they would do uh, single cell BCR sequencing. In addition, we will take those double positive cells uh, and then basically sort out CD27 positive memory B cells and then uh, bait positive uh, B cells. So the bait in, in our case is strictly the trimer. Uh, and, and those CD27 bait positive B cells will be uh, subjected to single cell uh, BCR sequencing as well by this team. And we, we have uh, in the past week worked out all the sorting strategy as well as the sequencing strategy. The final approach that we're taking is, uh, is simply to take serum with the high neutralizing antibody titers and, and uh, absorb that with the trimer and then elude it's more complicated than what I'm describing, but then elute the uh, bound antibodies uh, and subject that to mass spec analysis by Trixi Uberhide at NYU. Now Trixie's done this uh, in the past and she could identify uh, neutralizing monoclonals in the serum of HIV infected individuals. But in that case, she had lots of uh, database to work with in terms of neutralizing monoclonal antibody sequences. David, uh, just a reminder that your time is uh, over, so uh, it's getting to the 10 minutes mark. Okay, uh, so that's the final strategy. Uh, the specifics I won't describe, but at least we could identify the amino acid sequence. And from the uh, DNA uh, sequencing, we could uh, sort out the antibody species. And from there, we would simply construct, uh, screen, optimize, and all the subsequent steps. So that, in brief, is, uh, is what we're involved with. Uh, of course, we are now supporting uh, the activities of many laboratories uh, who are working uh, in this area uh, with, with uh, our know-how or with our reagents. So thank you. Thank you, David. This is wonderful. Uh, anybody who has a question for uh, David, please uh, raise your hand. Virginia. Hi, this is uh, Virginia Cornish. I'm in the departments of chemistry and systems biology. My laboratory is using synthetic biology to engineer a living yeast vaccine. And I'd like to know the best way to team up with you in the Aaron Diamond Center. Um, I guess uh, just you. write me and we'll, we'll follow up. Uh, you may have written to me, but I'm, I'm about I a, hundred, a, I, a couple of hundred emails behind. Okay, uh, thank you, Virginia. Um, uh, Andy, go ahead. 
David, you, I think you mentioned you were going to look at 12 patients for uh, selection of antibodies. How are you going to select those 12 patients? Well, I, I think what I didn't say is that uh, together with the infectious disease folks and, and pathology folks, we, we are starting a cohort uh, of convalescent cases, uh, largely focused uh, initially on the new Rochelle patients. And, and so we will be systematically studying those individuals, uh, virology, immunology, uh, mm. and in that process, we'll be uh, doing a binding quantitative ELISA, and for those with high binding activity, we could su do pseudo pseudovirus neutralization. That will help us select the cases. It would also help the plasma therapy effort. So, so David, is Andrea, so uh, do you see a complementarity between the serological test and the PCR-based test, and what, what would be the best way to administer them on, a, on an ongoing basis. In particular, there, there's been a lot of concern about the fact that in the United States, we are adopting a only symptomatic testing strategy without testing asymptomatic people. Um, any, any thoughts on that? Well, I mean, the two tests tell us different things. Right. One measures uh, for viral RNA and the other measures uh, antibody response uh, to the virus. Uh, and and we, we now know that the antibody responses uh, generally uh, appear uh, about a week out. Uh, in some cases, maybe a little bit earlier than that, but generally a week out. But, but the, uh, many of them remain rather weak for the first month, uh, and particularly the less symptomatic cases. Uh, so uh, at this point, uh, ser serology is not great doesn't have great sensitivity in diagnosing the cases. Whereas PCR on the, on, on, on the nasal uh, swab is, is obviously more sensitive for that. But I think when we start to evaluate a whole population, uh, I certainly believe that we should do uh, extensive testing using both approaches to get clarity on what's going on with the epidemic and therefore uh, carry out our mitigation measures accordingly. See, there's one more question by Stuart, but um, actually you're running out of time. So perhaps that can be done by uh, email. Otherwise, we're going to start running late on the, on the program. 